Uh, let's talk about uh, how we can achieve persistency with players' data. Sometimes we have to save this player's data somewhere or we have to make this data persistent. So let's say we have uh, HP, so health and score. And some the, the main question with that is that we have to make the player aware that they actions are actually meaningful in the future. So if they do something in one level, it will go through the next level and they will be aware that, okay, uh, if I do something here, I can be rewarded and I can build up this score and I must be careful with my actions because maybe I can be punished and my health won't be, um, won't be as high as it, it, it was. Uh, I won't be with the maximum health in the next level, so I must be uh, careful with what I'm doing. In Godot Engine, this is kind of this is kind of tricky because uh, the the big deal with Godot Engine is that if we have scenes, like if we have, let's say, we have three levels, right? So we want the player to pass through these three levels, and maybe we are going to use the get scene. Let me write this down here. The thing is that we can use this get tree dot uh, change scene method and we also have this change scene to method so this method uh, that you can see here so we can use that method this method to make the scene change to the next scene that you want so you can pass a path to a packet scene in your file manager or with the get scene to method so this other one here you can pass a packet scene file packet scene <coughs> with these two uh, with these two approaches what we can do uh, what the what the Godot engine will do is that it will clean up the whole scene tree uh, just saving uh, actually it only frees the the first node of the scene tree and then it will take it out of the scene tree and load this new one that we are pressing so if we pass a packet scene it will load this one and insert it as the root node of the new scene and if we pass a packet scene path it will load the packet scene and etc but then with that what will happen is that everything that was in this scene tree that we are testing or that the player is playing is that will be lost because it was freed from memory right so the the main problem that I'm, <laughs> that I'm addressing here is that we will lose players data if we change the scene or if the player quit the, the game as well. So the idea is that uh, we want to make this data persistent even between play sessions, right? Uh, before we get started, first I want to say that this video is being sponsored by my patrons, one of them being God of Grantis, Grantis that is on the chat now. So thank you so much for your support. And also, I'd like you to uh, follow me on itch.io. So go there, follow me. The link will be uh, available in the description after I finish this this live stream. But that said, let's go to Godot Engine. Uh, so yeah, that. So I already prepared. Uh, let me open the GitHub desktop here because uh, we are going to use GitHub features so we can pass through all these uh, approaches quickly. Let me switch to uh, yeah, this repository. So the first approach that I want to show you is this player resource approach. Uh, let, do, let do the trick. Yeah, so let's open it up again. again. Uh, player persistent data. So. The first thing that I want to show you is an approach that I often use when I want to sync um, some other nodes with the player's data. So let me address this, this approach. So this is the player's data resource uh, approach. Okay. Uh, what this do is that we create a resource for the player. Let me open the player data here. So this is the resource. This is what will be the container for the player's data, okay? 
So uh, let me explain how resources work in Godot Engine. In Godot Engine, resources are one one time loaded uh, object. So there is only one instance of this object available in memory. And every time we make a change in this uh, object, in this resource, it will reflect on the other objects that are using this as a reference. So the, in, in this specific resource, this player's data resource, I have here a signal that is the, the updated signal that is emitted every time a property is updated. So every time we change the value of a property. And we have the max value, the health, and the score properties. Since this is a resource, I can e export the resource uh, to other uh, to other nodes. So, Godot engine can be Godot engine can be broke down into two uh, types, general types. So we have the nodes, and we so in Godot engine we have the nodes and we have the resources. These are the building blocks of Godot engine. Resources are basically data containers, and nodes will use this data. So, for instance, when you have a sprite node, uh, what we have is that this node will use a texture resource. So, uh, we have these resources and we have the nodes. Nodes use resource and resources are loaded only once, okay? So, basically what we can do is that, um, let's play the game. So, this is a pretty simple game. We will use this, the same game between all the 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 approaches that I will show and you can see that here the score is being updated when the player picks up some uh, coins and the health bar is being updated as well when the player took damage and when we switch uh, these properties are maintained so we keep these properties in memory because we are using this resource uh, how this happens how this is kept in memory and how we manage to not lose this re these resources if we go to the level one scene basically what this uh, we have the interface and we have the player so let me also open the player scene and the interface scene so basically both the player and the interface are users of this resource that I called player's data. That is this resource that we can see. I think that you guys can't see, so I will throw it there. Okay, so uh, both are users of this player data resource here. So what I did is that, okay, the pickup area that is the node responsible for picking up uh, coins and stuff like this, uh, we'll have a reference for this resource. So here we, we can see that it, it has a reference for this. Um, the pickup area will use this resource. It, ha it has a reference to this resource. So all it does is that it will take this resource and when something enters in this area, it will get the score of this coin and add to the score of the player's data. Then we also have the hurt the hurt box which also has a reference to this player's data and what it will do is that <coughs> whenever something enters in this area in this hurt box area it will disable the the collision shape and um, it will actually disable the collision shape and then it will uh, decrease the player's data health so basically what this approach does is that it, it uses this feature of resources that they are only loaded once until we call uh, Godot to duplicate the reference or, or something like that. And uh, every node that uses this resource will be using the same resource. So if something happens to one of the reference, uh, all of the reference will be in sync. So if we go to the user interface here, uh, the user interface also uses the this player's data resource and it connects the updated and the died signal to itself. And whenever the, the player's data is updated, it will also update the interface. So since they are all using this resource, they will be all in sync as I showed you when playing the game. So basically this is what happened in the, in the background. Uh, when the player 
gets a coin, the pickup area will update the score of this player's data and since this score is updated, uh, the player's data will emit a signal and then the, um, the interface will get this signal and update itself as well. So this is what is happening here. And since we can pass this reference between scenes, actually since all the, the scenes are using this reference, so between the, the two levels that are both using the, players, the player data resource, uh, this is maintained between these levels and even between the, these screens. So in the game over the end of the game screen, the score is maintained as well. So to summarize, the player's data resource is very easy to set up. You saw, uh, it's, it's basically a resource, a bidding resource. Uh, and we can extend this resource. Let me open this script. So basically it's just a resource that is nothing too much complicated with that. Resources aren't it even in the scene tree, they are in the memory somewhere else. So we are basically making reference to them and they are kept in memory until everyone that was supposed to use this resource uh, is not using it anymore. So uh, until everyone that uses this resource is not in memory anymore, this resource will be kept in memory and updated. This is why we can transition between scenes. We can use the get scene dot change scene to method and we won't lose that player's data because it is always in the in the memory until we don't have a reference to it anymore so the advantage of this approach it is it is it is easy to sync with the ui we basically just have to add this reference to the ui and connect a signal and make it update whenever this uh, resource updates its uh, its properties uh, only the nodes that actually access th that actually needs this resource that actually needs to know that this resource exists will make a reference to it so we don't run into the problem where we have spaghetti code getting uh, someone else to uh, make a reference for us and then accessing this other thing and basically making a code between these two classes and uh, this is a, a advantage for me because it makes sure that if we make a change, we'll be it will be easy to find where we should update the the classes and what are the classes that should be updated. It it is also very nice for um, multiplayer. So, for instance, if we let me change this. So, for instance, if we want to have multiplayer a multiplayer game with player's data being saved for both players, we basically just need to uh, duplicate this resource and set it up on the second player's uh, UI and and area, etc. We just need to uh, override the player one data that was supposed to be on the second player to the second player's data. Basically, we just need to do that. We, just we will just have a new <coughs> player resource, a player's data resource. Also, there is another uh, advantage with this approach. So basically, if we want to save it to the player's disk for some reason, basically everything that we have to do is using the built-in resource saver. So we can use resource saver dot save self. Uh, I think that we have to pass a path actually. Let me see that. Yeah, we have to pass a path and then the resource. So we can basically use user slash slash uh, player data dot scene and then we'll pass self and it will save the player's data. And to load, we can use the same uh, path and load this resource. This is not optimal for like games with competitive play. Like, like if we have a competitive game, this won't be a nice approach because uh, it will be on plain text. So the player will be ha will have access to this resource on the file uh, system and they can change the data there. So this is not optimal though. But for a simple approach for saving data and stuff like this, this is a very simple way to achieve that. Now, there are some drawbacks for this approach as well. Um, as I said, if there is no reference to this resource so if there is if no node is using this resource the player's data resource 
Good Out will free it from memory and the player will lose all the data. So let's say, for instance, the main menu doesn't have any reference to this resource. So if the player managed to go, to the, go back to the main menu um, in the middle of the play session, so let's say here, we open the main menu, uh, Godot will free this resource from memory and the player will lose the progress in the game. So the player will lose the score, the health, etc. So this is very dangerous and is actually very hard to maintain a consistency of player's progress because we will have to make sure that every possible scene that the player can open will maintain this reference in the memory. So this is a drawback of this approach. Another drawback of this approach is that every uh, user of this data, so let's say the user interface, every user of this data, so every node that uses this, um, this player's data, will have to maintain a reference to it. So we will have to add this line of code, this line of code that I'm showing here, on every node that will actually use this resource. So it can be quite of troublesome to add this over and over whenever you need. So for instance, uh, if I open the player scene here, there are two nodes that are using this and there are two references in the same scene to the same resource, which can be uh, something bad, a, a bad architecture, I don't know. But yeah, this is an approach that actually I, I would use for like a simple game for a game jam or something like that. Uh, next, let's talk about, uh, let me go to this scene, let's just change. Okay, so uh, let me, <coughs> let's explain the singleton now. So as the guys were saying in the chat, we also have the ability to use the singletons. So singletons are a design pattern that we have available in Godot Engine uh, we have built-in available in Godot Engine and basically singletons have two advantages. They are globally accessible and they are globally accessible and they are only loaded once. So resources are also loaded only once but they are not globally accessible. So I say that one of the drawbacks of the... Uh, so we can use this singleton approach and we can basically just um, use it just as if we are using it's very similar to that uh, resource approach that I just showed you. So if I change to the singleton approach and if we s compare these both branches, so let me compare this to the player's resource, we'll see that basically we eliminate the player's data reference because as I said, singletons are globally available so we don't need to make a reference for them in the script. That's basically all that I did. I removed all the reference to the player's data resource and instead I, I used the, the player data singleton. So uh, you can see that uh, all that I did actually to the player's data.gd file was changing it from a resource to a node. So if we go to Grot Engine here, yes, reload, clear. This is the new player, this is the player's data uh, file, the, the player's data script, and it is exactly the same with the exception that instead of extending a resource, is now extending a node. And the way that you can turn a node or a scene into a singleton is by going up here into the project, uh, project tab here, project settings, we can go to the auto load and basically we can pass a path to the file that we will auto load that will be turned into a singleton and then we'll pass a name to this file. So in this case I say that the, the new name of the name of this singleton will be players data and once we do that um, Godot will create, will create a global variable that we can use with this name, so with player's data name. So there where I have uh, the pickup area, when it was a, when it, before the singleton approach, it have, it had 
a reference to this resource and now it doesn't need a reference to the player's data resource because now it was turned into a singleton and basically we just need to access this singleton and um, address it properly so if I save this and we play the game again everything is the same so we have the score we have the health bar if I take damage here it will update if I pass to the new scene it will uh, maintain this uh, this data and let me just show you what happens so if okay, okay. so we have here the scene and if you go to the remote scene we have what is happening when we are playing the game so you can see that we have the root node and then the level which is the scene that is currently so uh, basically what we can see here in the remote scene is that we have the level that is the current scene that we can see here but uh, as a sibling of this scene we have the player's data this is how singletons work so let's let's pay attention to this scene tree here to this tab here to this dock that we have here on the left when I change to another scene it will change this node here you saw a change from level 1 to game over scene this is actually what clears the data if we don't have like a singleton or a resource or something like that to keep the players uh, data intact uh, so to maintain this players data outside of this cleanup that happens when we change scenes so we have this the players data as a sibling of this uh, of the root node of the scene that we are actually playing and since this scene uh, since this cleanup doesn't affect the player's data we maintain the player's data between sessions but there are two main disadvantages of this approach of the singleton approach first of all if we quit the game as imagined we will also lose the player um, we will also lose the player's data so we can see that now the score is reset to zero and uh, everything will be reset because this because singletons are, are nodes and when we finish up the execution of the game all nodes are freed from memory and we will lose all the data that the player uh, did but let's talk about the advantages and disadvantages of singletons you saw that since uh, they are very similar to this resource approach they have many of the advantages of the resource approach they are very easy to synchronize with the UI basically the UI and uh, all the nodes just have to make a reference to this uh, singleton actually they don't make a reference the reference is globally accessible they just have to access this variable that is holding this singleton uh, it's very so it's very easy to sync the the users of this data so if one user changes this data it will affect all the other users very simply uh, is it is a centralized solution so uh, if we know that we need if we have to make any changes we know where it should change we just need to go to the file that is using the singleton and change whatever you we want to change there the data is persistent is very persistent until we close the game so differently from the um, resource approach which as soon as we lose a, a node, so as soon as there is no one making a reference to it anymore, the resource will be freed from memory. With singletons, we don't run into this risk, which is very, very risky. So with singletons, we, we don't have to be concerned about that. No one has to be making a reference to this singleton. It will be just be kept in memory no matter what until we close the game. So it will be always available. So singletons in that sense are a better approach than resource uh, the player's data resource uh, now some drawbacks it's very hard to identify who will actually use this singleton why because it's very tempting when we are using global variables that we will make every class access it and when we do this access to this uh, singleton to this global object if we make a change in this object we'll have to figure out everyone that is using it everyone that will ever use it and update the interaction so let's say uh, for instance 
let me go to this singleton place data, okay? So let's say we change this signal name. So let's say instead of updated, we say player data updated. Now we have to figure out everyone that was using updated instead and then go to the file and update them. So you can say that this can be done quite simply using uh, the replace, uh, finding files, and then we can basically search for updated and replace, and then we can basically update them accordingly, right? But uh, what if you have another type of file? What if you have a building file, uh, a building script that is making a reference to this singleton? Uh, as we can see, if we search in finding files, it doesn't search for scene files, it, it just searches for uh, GD scripts and shader files, so you have to update it. In, in this specific case, you would have to update this manually. And uh, another disadvantage of the singleton approach is that it is global. This is very arguable because globals can be good, globals can be bad. But for the sake of this video, I think there is a consensus that uh, making something global accessible is a bad practice because, as I said, it's tempting to use global variables, global objects uh, everywhere. So unless you have a solid code base and you know that once you make this singleton, it won't change later in your game. Uh, this can be risky to, to have it global accessible. And then comes the main disadvantage of this uh, singleton approach when compared to the player's data resource, with the player's resource approach. Singletons, as I said, they are only loaded once and you can load them twice, etc. The, the pattern is you load singletons only once and everyone will make a reference to this singleton. Since this is a feature, a building feature of singletons, this, make, this makes it this this makes it harder <laughs> to implement multiplayer support because since there will be only one singleton uh, how will you manage to add support for a second player you can say that in the players data we can make these resources arrays instead and basically we can use the indexing of the arrays as the indexing of the players as well so Let's say that this maximum health will be a array. Will be an array, and then the first index will be uh, the current amount. So this is a way to implement uh, multiplayer support, for instance. But if you don't plan this ahead, so if you decide that you want to add support for a multiplayer after you actually finish the building of this architecture every other node now will have to be aware that the change that there was a changing in the architecture of the player's data script and now instead of making this kind of interaction like score uh, just updating the score they will have to say okay the score uh, at the first position will will have this will suffer from this operation so yeah it, it will be very tricky to implement multiplayer support if you are making uh, this with this singleton approach so I think that this is a drawback as well so yeah so we have some drawbacks we have some advantages, and just to make it clear one approach doesn't exclude doesn't exclude the other so we can pretty much so you can pretty much use every approach that i will show you here together and who knows you can do whatever you want but you can figure out a way to use both approaches so the single time approach the resource approach together and the next one that i will talk next i'll move on to the next approach which is the save file approach and this branch actually in this specific branch i think that is this one yeah in this specific branch uh what i did is 
uh, using both approaches. So I will use the singleton approach and a save to file approach. So let me show you what this, uh, how this happens. If you go down here, reload. So basically what this does is let's go to the player's data script here. All that it does now is that it added two uh, methods to the player's data singleton. So it, it, it added, it added two features to the singleton. Basically these features are, it can load a file from the, from the, from the user disk and it can save this file as well. With this approach, we have something that we didn't have, we didn't have with the resource saving approach. Because resource saving, uh, with resource saver, we are not able to encrypt the data. So, as I say, the player will open a plain text file, and they can change whatever is the content of this file. But with this approach, we can actually save this file with an encrypted, uh, with an encryption key. Uh, it can be whatever key, but it can also be a randomly generated key or something like this. So you can pass whatever you want. Uh, actually, there is another approach to that, which is using just encryption. Yeah, so you pass a pull byte array instead of just a single word or a pass. And then you can store this to, to this file and then load it again and make the proper parsing. So this is a feature that has in this approach. And if we test this now, let's test the game. With this approach, we have something that we didn't have with the other two approaches. Let's see what is. So if we play the game, we can... Be and you already saw this, so <laughs> uh, it won't be a surprise anymore. But take a look and, at the health and the score. I will take some damage here and then we will quit I will test this again play and as you can see the the score and the health uh, were, were, keep, were, were kept between the play session so now we can keep the data saved even when the player quit the game so this is a the, the hardest persistency that we can get because with the other two, the player data would be persistent when the, play, the, the game was playing. But with this approach, the player's data will be persistent even if the player closes the game. So this is a very nice feature. But nothing comes for free, right? So we have some drawbacks with this approach as well. So let's talk about them. Okay, so as I said, one of the advantages of this approach of saving the, the player's data to a file that will be kept in the player's disk is that we don't lose a we, we don't run into the risk of losing player's data if there is no one making a reference to this file as we were as we were losing as we were running into this risk with the resource file we have this data saved we have this data kept even between sessions so if the player co closes the game with the singleton or with the resource approach, the player will, will, will lose their data. But with this save load from this approach, they, they won't lose their, their data. And another plus of this approach is that it can save and load as many players data as we want. So if we have two, three, four, five players uh, playing at the same time, um, <coughs> this saving file will be able to cap all of these players data uh, in memory and we can load it and parse it when we need it but one of the disadvantages of this approach is that we need to parse data so let's go back to good old engine here okay so this is the 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 parsing um section of this approach we will First, we will store all the player's data as a JSON file, turning this into a dictionary. So instead of saving a resource, as we did with the player's resource, uh, player data resource, the first approach that I showed you, 
and now we will have to turn all of this data into a dictionary and then we'll have to parse the, this dictionary to a JSON file using this method and then store it in the, the file that we are using and when we load this file we will have to parse all of this dictionary, all of these JSON file properties into the properties that we want in, your, in our game so in this case we'll have to go to the health um, to the health key in, in this dictionary and then set it as the health property of this object so on and so forth and this can cause a lot of troubles uh, let me explain you why so we are making parsing right so what we are doing is that we will turn one type of data into another type of data that this file format or this dictionary or JSON file in this case will understand the tricky thing with that is that uh, in Godot Engine we have some types of data that only exist in Godot Engine. So, for instance, other types of files will not understand, will not be able to save this type of data. So, for instance, let me go back to Godot Engine here. Let's say we have a vector2 vector to var position. So let's say we want to save the position of the player, right? Uh, here goes the trick. JSON files and most of the files that I know doesn't have support for vector two types of, of data. They don't have support for this uh, data structure that we call uh, vector two in Godot engine because this is a building type of Godot engine. So if we want to save this data uh, to a JSON file, let's add a new property here called position. What we will have to do is to create a new type, uh, use a type that is supported by this file type, so in this case by JSON files, and try to create an architecture in which we can rely for uh, parsing this data later. So let's say we can create a, I don't know, a array, I think that JSON files support array. And then we will say that the first position will be the X position of the this vector. And then the second position of this array will be the Y uh, position, Y property, the Y property of this uh, vector two. So let's say here we'll call um, uh, position dot x position dot y and then at the bottom we will have to make the same so position dot x is equal to dictionary dot uh, actually position position and then the first index of this position and then the y property of this vector two will be the second position of this array. So why this is actually a problem? So uh, the first thing that I that comes into my mind when we are talking about this parsing, this type of conversion in, into this file, because as I so showed you, there uh, some some types of data are not supported in JSON files, for instance. The thing is, if you have a change into the, the engineering of your game, so let's say you change the type of a, of a property in your game, now you have to have another method of, another way, another type of conversion to parse this new data. So going back to Goro, let's say instead of having a vector2, we will actually have a... I don't know, a dictionary, for instance. Uh, no, this doesn't make sense, but let's say we have uh, an array or something like this. Now, arrays don't have X and Y values. So we would have to update this, right? So we'll have to make something like, uh, this will be the X, this will be the X one, and then this will be the one. 
and now we change how we are parsing this data between this these properties and we'll also have to update this there as well now can you think how troublesome this can get this is one of the reasons why we often add a version property in most of the saving files that we have so one of the ways that we could work around that is having a version property in this dictionary in this json file that will say what was the version of the game that this saving file was created with so let's say we have the game running into version 1.0 so 1.0 and then we save this file and we save in this version property of this dictionary that the version is 1.0 in our game we would have to have two types of parsing so we would have to make so that when we are parsing uh, this data file we will have to identify what is the version that we should use so what is the difference between one version to another and then we will have to make sure that we can parse this this file in two versions so let's say in one version you identify that there is the one dot one version we, you can parse this property as a vector two so you make the parsing as a vector two and then you identify you can make something like a match uh, a match statement like this let's say okay so here we could have match dictionary um, version So, uh, and when you have another type of, when you have a change in the parsing, you would have something like this to make sure that you are parsing the data correctly. And this would also have to be made when you are saving the file. So, something like here. And you have to add like a version property here, which would be something like get the game um, project, something like this, the, the project file game game properties dot version. And you have to make sure to read this version file and etc. etc. to make sure that you don't lose compatibility of uh, saving uh, later on. So this is a one of the disadvantages of this approach. Another disadvantage of this approach is that it is highly, as I said, it is highly dependent on the the way that you architecture your game. So the way that you parse this file will be different depending on the if you have some changes in the feature. You have to be very aware of how the, the project will scale so you can have the proper way to handle this, uh, this, this file parsing. Uh, another disadvantage, disadvantage that I see on this approach is that it is quite low level. So when you are making this approach, you, you'll, be, you'll have to be both into a mindset of gaming, of, of game development, uh, programming of game development logic and also on computer handling file system logic because they will now be merged into the same thing and this can be tricky to to handle uh, this approach also is kind of corruption prone because if something happens between this parsing so let's say if we manage not complete the saving and the player just kill the application before we are able to save this file to the disk the file will be corrupted and the player will lose the data if the player do something strange in the disk and that affects this file the file will be corrupted as well and also each object that we use this file will have to parse it into a different way probably so let's say uh, we have two two or three users of this file each one of the, them will have to parse it in different ways to get uh, different properties or something like this but to be honest overall 
uh, this is a good approach and I will definitely I think I, I mean this is the only approach that you can use to maintain the players uh, the players data persistence between sessions without running the risk of players modifying the, the properties and as I showed you um, here in this file there is nothing preventing us from using all of these approaches together so for instance uh, this approach is actually the the singleton approach with two extra with two extra methods, which is this load data and this save data. So yeah, basically it's up to you to decide what is the best approach or what is the best mix of approaches that you can use to address this problem. As long as you can make the player's data persistent, you can create this feeling of progression to the player, right? So you can give the player the feeling that the actions actually have a meaningful impact, a meaningful impact in the future. Because this is a, a, a very important feature to have in your game to make your player feel like uh, they can make something and this thing is important and they will have and they actions actually have value. So now let's go to the chat and see what we have here. Storing vectors two into JSON works for me. How? JSON file don't have support for vector two though, do they? No, you have to make a parse. Uh, JSON files don't have support for... I think that actually when we use this to JSON, maybe it parses it properly, but I don't know. Converse a ver variant var to JSON text and return, return the result. Huh. Let me make a test on it because this will, will be this will be interesting because if we manage to parse let's say the player's data right so the, the resource the resource file this will be a quite good approach actually it, it will merge all the approaches that I show that I showed you uh, into a single file so let me see if we can store a resource so this will be quite tricky. Let me do everything here and let's export export resource for player data. And let's create this resource. So I will go here because if 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 Godot can manage to parse all of these all of its uh, data types into a JSON format, this this is amazing. This is a plus that I, I didn't ever thought about. So let's create a new resource here. Yeah, we already have it. So open, I will create. Hmm? Now let me duplicate this because this is not meant to be node. Data, okay, player resource will be the name. So player resource, duplicate. And then this will be the actual script of this. Player resource, we will make this a resource. We will take rid of this. It doesn't have a ready. And we won't be saving this resource like this. We use the singleton for that. Right? So let's open this singleton. Can you guys? Uh, yeah. So let's open the singleton. And then we will drag and drop this resource there. Clear data. Uh, 
Oh, I... Okay, uh, I was supposed to delete from this other part. So, this one. This is a resource. Then... This. And in this player data, we'll drag and drop this resource here. And actually, I, I don't want to save anything. I just want, uh, I just need to make sure, I just want to have a print of how this resource will actually be converted to a JSON file. So print to JSON player, player data. This is what I want to get. Let's save. Yeah, see, uh, yeah, <laughs> basically this is just a pointer to the resource. So, yeah, I, w I am kind of booming now. <laughs> because I thought that it will convert the, the actual file. So let's open this in the file manager. Player data, what is it? Players resource, no player data resource. Source. This is the one. Yeah. So I thought that Grot will would actually convert all of this data, but in runtime, uh, what uh, what what was what were the values that would be here in runtime and convert this to a JSON file. And after that, it we will be able to read this JSON format and parse it as a JSON using the parse JSON file that we have uh, here. Parse JSON. So this parse JSON actually, uh, actually returns a variant, right? So, um, and this to JSON, what is it? To JSON, to JSON, also receives a variant. Variant are, uh, is a type that Godot has in, in its building types that can be anything in the engine. But unfortunately, it, it didn't work. I thought that it would basically just create a file similar to uh, this, <coughs> but as a, a JSON file. So this all of these data will be available as a JSON file that could be parsed using this parse JSON method here. What is it? Using this. And then we will be able to parse this data like seamlessly in, in, as a single file, a JSON file, and as a resource. So this would be actually very cool to have. But can I do that? I think that I, we can do that, but this goes beyond the scope of this live stream. Groot stores them in a stream, like, okay, yeah, when using resource, it uses, it, it, it uses references, I guess. Yeah, I wonder, what are the other types of, uh, of Groot that we can actually use? I think that for every object, I think that Godot will actually parse it as a reference, just a, a single reference. But I think that for, uh, let's say, AABB, let's see what it prints for AABB. Or rect. So let's try a rect. Rect to rect. And then here we will <coughs> we'll be printing this right data. Mm. Nice, nice. That's very, very, very convenient actually. So I think that this is, I, I like that. So I think that for every format that is not an object, so for every type that is not a object, Mainly, I, I don't know why they call, they say that it could be a variant, 
because objects are not converted that well but for every building type so for every one of these we can parse them as a json format this is very nice to have actually you could use two json function inside your player data which creates an anonymous object in the player's data resource look to the good source code yeah when using resource yeah so i think that the only type of data the only data structure that Godot doesn't actually parse properly let me see something no i think uh, i think that it will actually be just an object yeah yeah i think that Godot can convert any of the the objects because they are I don't know why actually <laughs> to be very uh, to be very honest, but yeah, that was it I guess. So let me close growth now. Close this. Quit. Close this. Did I? Cart of changes. Yeah, so that was it. These are these were the three uh, approaches that I often take regarding making the player's data persistent. Uh, I will be making this live stream a a video format later, uh, and I will add the timestamps and every all the these good things. So, yeah, I hope you guys enjoy it. Uh, I don't know if I will keep this format. It will be cool to know if, if this is a good format to watch. Um, because this is... I'm making this because I, I had a... I made a tweet lately and people suggested that live streams could be a good approach and I made this format to see, to test if live streams would be actually a good approach. So yeah, thank you so much for watching. Let me see if there is something else that I want to tell you guys. Yeah, don't forget to subscribe. <laughs> don't forget to subscribe, uh, not subscribe, uh, follow me on each, but also don't forget to subscribe to the YouTube channel and that kind of good stuff. So that was it. Let me take rid of this safe <laughs> text here. So that was it. Thank you so much for watching. Keep developing and see you the next time. Bye bye.